Jedna od najvećih televizijskih zvijezda svih vremena, Kristijana Mampur, izvještavala je u zadnjih 30 godina iz svih ratnih i kriznih zona. Intervjuisala je najvažnije ličnosti svijeta, autorica je nagrađivanih istraživačkih priča i dokumentaraca. Ali Amampur priznaje da su ratovi u bivšoj Jugoslaviji. Posebno izvještavanje iz opkoljenog Sarajeva, događaji koji su obilježili njenu karijeru. Uvijek direktna, jasna i provokativna. Čuvena reporterka, jedna od najpriznatijih žena u svijetu medija na globalnom nivou, dobitnica 9 Emija, dupon nagrade i niza drugih, UNESCO-va ambasadorica dobre volje i glavna međunarodna reporterka CNN-a, Kristijana Mampur, gošća je N1 na 1. Hello Christian, welcome to Sarajevo, welcome to N1. It's really my pleasure having you here. It's actually a real pleasure for me to be here, to be with you and to be back in Sarajevo, especially at this really very important and historic moment. Mm -hmm. uh, the main reason that you are uh, here again is actually the anniversary of the Srebrenica genocide. Let me ask you first for your comment on everything that's happened uh, in recent weeks regarding Srebrenica. The failure of the UN uh, to adopt uh, Srebrenica resolution, uh, then continuation of uh, uh, genocide denial, and the fact that the whole Western world, the Western politicians and, uh, and uh, Western media are on the one side, and uh, Serbian and Russian uh, politicians and uh, media on the, on the other side. Look. What happened at the Security Council was an abomination. It wasn't blaming anybody, it wasn't saying who did what, it was trying to establish a fact, the fact that genocide had taken place in, in Srebrenica. As far as I'm concerned, the world knows that that is a fact because the International Criminal Tribunal, the World Court, they have recognized that genocide took place in Srebrenica and they have prosecuted ringleaders for that very crime. So this would have been one more formal enshrining of that and it is very, very disappointing that Russia decided it couldn't go that way. But you know, the tension between Russia and the West just simply goes up and up and up, simply rises. And the political trouble between Russia and the West plays itself out in places mm -hmm. such as the former Yugoslavia all through the war. The Russians supported one side, as you know, all through the war. And, and they continue to do that. It is weird. It is a denial of history. I understand that people want to move forward, but without understanding and recognizing what happened, one can never move forward. And the people of Srebrenica deserve that recognition and deserve justice and deserve to have what happened called by its real name. Mm -hmm. But the world, uh, Christian, uh, still ignore what's happened. No, I, I don't uh, think the world After the fall of Srebrenica. The same, uh, the same way the uh, world ignored what, what happened in Rwanda, in Palestine, and everywhere. I mean, uh, we have a problem with the United, United Nations. Why? Look, what happened in Bosnia, and I covered the war along with my colleagues from beginning to end, was a very big stain on the international conscience. It was a massive failure of, of collective security in Europe. It was allowing the worst slaughter and genocide and the sieges uh, since World War II to take place here on this territory where, let's face it, 10 years earlier the, the, the Olympic Games had been played uh, throughout the whole world to watch. So it was a huge failure. But a couple of things happened. Despite the huge number of people who lost their lives, despite the huge number of people who were made refugees, despite ripping this part of the world apart, some positive happened and that was us the reporters who told the story day in and day out we were committed we were here in solidarity with the people of Sarajevo and the people of Bosnia the people of Srebrenica my colleague went to Srebrenica got wounded in Srebrenica couldn't get out of Srebrenica just to tell that story and stayed there until people actually did something and yes it was a very high price to pay the the massacre the the death the deliberate slaughter of Bosnian men and boys just because they were Muslim. But in the end, in the end, it was too much for our democracies to, to bear. They couldn't continue to allow this to happen. They couldn't allow this to happen without stopping it. And so they did. 
and they have stopped it and it is not happening anymore. And that is a triumph and that is a victory and that is good. But the politics remain stuck in 1995, the emergency band-aid, mm -hmm. which was the Dayton Accords, which was okay for the moment, but is not okay now. So the politics are still stuck. The institutions don't work. And of course, the, the victims and the families of Srebrenica, those who are still burying their dead, those who still have to have their lost ones identified, they are still suffering. And around the world, in places like Syria, the lessons of Srebrenica have not been learned. Mm -hmm. And it's true, of course, that in, in, uh, in, in Rwanda, at the same time the Bosnia war was raging, in 1994, nearly a million people, one million people were slaughtered in three months and the world didn't intervene. And the world has had to apologize for that, yeah. you know, Let's ever since. Let's go back to the media. Why do mainstream media in the, in, in the countries in which political leaders deny uh, genocide in Srebrenica, uh, too often uh, use as an as a, as a extended hand of, of politicians. I mean, why uh, journalists do not have courage to investigate, to tell people the truth, or the truth is just what a uh, politicians say? Well, here's the thing. The politicians failed, as I've said. Failed, failed, failed. From Russia to the United States and all the countries in between, they failed. But the journalists didn't fail. Take David Rode, take Martin Bell, take, uh, you know, Peter Jennings, take CNN. We investigated. We put our lives at risk. We lost our colleagues. We saw our colleagues killed and wounded. And we saw our colleagues kidnapped and held hostage just to tell the story, just to keep investigating. So I still believe that in a sea of despair, the only bright light was the civilians of Sarajevo and the other besieged cities and the, 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 the terrible places where war was happening in Bosnia, who resisted, who refused to surrender, who refused to give up their dignity, and who lived in basements and you know had to go out to collect water and wood and food and whatever it was, who suffered the worst and the longest siege in modern times, and eventually the worst genocide in Europe since World War II, which is what happened in Srebrenica. Those people were victorious, those people were resistors, those people were heroes. And by the same token, the journalists who lived with them, all of us who stayed here in solidarity, who didn't have weapons, but who used our cameras and our pens and whatever, you know, our words and our pictures to tell the story. You know, we were doing our professional duty, but doing our professional duty, we were also resisting. We were refusing to allow the lies that some people wanted to broadcast and the untruths that some people and some governments wanted to be the truth. Mm -hmm. We prevented that from happening. And the proof of that, the proof of that is that eventually the world intervened. Eventually the world had a peace process. Eventually the world had peacekeepers. Um, and eventually the world refused to allow what happened in Bosnia to happen in Kosovo. That's a triumph, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean to say mm -hmm. that it's perfect. And as I say, the politics are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. And I believe there needs to be a reopening of the political system that ended the war for the future in order to allow Bosnia to get to Europe and to have its institutions actually work and not to be on international life support, which it is, it needs to have a different political reality. And that will take courage by the people here and that'll take a huge another struggle, but a political struggle. Yeah, a year before uh, Srebrenica genocide, you, you asked President Clinton why all flip-flops by US administration, why not to stop uh, killings of civilians in, in Bosnia? And you made him very angry. I did make him angry. I didn't go out to make him angry. I went to ask the only question I could ask. And if I could paint a picture for you, and the people who lived through this war might, might understand it. It was about one o'clock in the morning. It was, you know, time zone change between the United States and here. Uh, we had to move from the Holiday Inn to the television station going down Sniper Alley. It was dark. It was scary. We got there we set up the live uh, you know shot and it was a global news conference and President Clinton was at CNN in Atlanta and I was one of the foreign correspondents picked to ask him a question and I asked him the only question I could ask having covered the war for several years by then and yes he got really angry and yes it sort of ricocheted around the world and you know for a long time many politicians used to call me madam because um, president clinton <laughs> told me there have been no flip flops madam so you know it it was it was it was quite a, a dramatic thing 
But I have to say that in the end, it was President Clinton who did intervene and who stopped it, and who did intervene before there was a similar genocide in Kosovo. And that took courage, because he didn't get a UN resolution. He got all the like-minded NATO nations to agree to stop what happened in Bosnia from happening in Kosovo. And that is very brave politically, and it took commitment, and it was a conscience vote, I believe because they saw what happened when they didn't do anything in Bosnia. And today, we don't have that. Look what's happening in Syria. We don't have anybody in Syria to ask that same question to President Obama, you know, or to President Putin, or to any other president who's you know, responsible for what's happening there, or at least you? could intervene. Because <laughs> we have tried, but because the Syrian government doesn't let us in, like the Serbian government didn't here. We had to cross front lines to get here. But worse than that, once we got here, we were considered you know, positive force once we got here. In Syria, you have ISIS slitting our throats. Who's going to go there? It is called the assassin's veto, mm -hmm. and it works. Now, there has been some very brave and very good reporting out of Syria, including by CNN, very brave reporters. But look how many people have lost their lives trying to tell that story. I tell it in a different way just about every day on my show, um, and I try to hold people's feet to the fire just like I did when I, when I was in the field, because that's the responsibility of journalists. Let's go back to uh, U.S. administration. Why uh, uh, State Department and other institutions says forgotten Bosnia? Whether this country has ever been a real vital interest of U.S. foreign policy or just, I mean, uh, it's used for some other purposes uh, as, a, as a bargaining tool. I don't think it's used for any other purpose. This is what I think. If you remember in 1991 when the Balkan War started, and even in 1992, uh, the Bush administration of the time said, we don't have a dog in this fight. In other words, this is not about our national interest. There is nothing here that's in their national interest. So it boiled down to the national interest was about national values. It was about morality, it was about democracy, it was about ethnic tolerance, religious tolerance, and it was about trying to recoup the failure of collective security. The West you know, had a, had a, had a strategy, NATO had a strategy of collective security, and it failed here, obviously. So that was the national interest in the end. The slaughter of civilians is not in anybody's national interest, but it wasn't an economic natural interest, although the Bosnia War had terrible ramifications throughout Europe, and it, it had huge pressures. You know, there were millions and millions of refugees who were going to, you know, many countries, obviously. That was a pressure. Um, you know, just this, this, this wound in the heart of Europe for so many years was a huge pressure and, and you know, we did not let anybody turn away. And so it was on the front pages every single day. It was at the top of the news every single day. It was on people's radio stations every single day. And they couldn't turn away. That was their natural, national interest, to prove to the world that we actually were a government and a people of, of rights, of humanity, of democracy, of religious tolerance. And Sarajevo embodied all of that. Mm -hmm. That's why it was such a disaster what happened here. For you, Sarajevo is a city of Courage and uh, human resistance? That's yes. How you said it. Yes, I do say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How old were you when the war was going on? Me. 18? 18. 20, yeah, where, 18. Where were you? Yes, yeah, so you know. You lived it. People resisted yeah. with everything that they had. So, uh, what has been the most uh, uh, influenced experience that you, that you uh, I mean, suffer here in, Sar in Sarajevo during your reporting? Um, well, you know, this was a war about civilians. So it was a war whose aim was to kill and move and ethnically cleanse civilians. And I had never witnessed that before because my previous coverage had been of the Gulf War a couple of years mm -hmm. before. Those were armies pitted against each other. This was the first time I'd witnessed, you know, human beings as the deliberate targets of a, of a very big war. And all you have to do is sit around here now and look at, all, look at the way Sarajevo and many other cities and towns and villages are surrounded by mountains. 
and that was where the Bosnian Serbs, with their backed by their patrons in Serbia, simply just kept shelling and mm -hmm. sniping. And so for a young person like myself at the time, and a young reporter, it was formative. Everything I saw here was formative. And to see and to report on women, children who were deliberately targeted, who were deliberately sniped, to see the pools of blood, to see the rose-shaped uh, petals of the mortar attack in the middle of the road and on pavements and sidewalks, um, to, to watch people in a very sophisticated and civilized part of the world cutting down trees for warmth, burning their books, to see a library on fire, to see national treasure on fire, um, not to have water, to be lining up for bread. I mean, that's the kind of thing you think happens in the really, 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 really poor part of the world. And it's not the thing you expect in Europe. So for me, it was very, very shocking. But I think also, um, you know, to, to learn what it meant to tell the truth and what it meant to be an objective journalist, I learned that here. Because as you know, many people want to create on the one hand, on the other hand. You know, everybody's yeah, equally neutral. guilty, neutral. They confuse objectivity with neutrality. And I suddenly realized, well, actually, no, objectivity is not about neutrality. It's actually about telling the truth. So it's about telling the whole story. That's what actually Ed, Ed Williams said recently. He said, I was, uh, I was objective, but not neutral. Yeah. Well, you can't be neutral anyway, but you especially can't be neutral in the cases of, of gross violations of, of hum humanitarian law, international law, I mean, basic war crimes. <laughs> you can't be neutral. You can never equate the aggressor with the victim. And you can't try to create a false moral equivalence, which is what our leaders were doing throughout the whole time. And as you know, the media here, the indigenous media, uh, was another tool of war, was another weapon of war mm -hmm. for their governments. And now you see it happening in the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Um, Russia Today, for instance, the propaganda tool that is used, and that completely confuses people. And so people don't know anymore what the truth is unless they have their own stories, their own eyewitness reports, their own you know, trusted people who can tell them what's actually happening. And that is another engine of war that keeps people at war, which is why I'm so convinced that what the media does in these situations makes a huge difference. If you tell the truth and you say what's going on, you know, it's, it's a huge differentiator in these situations. But the other kind of journalists actually played a different role. I mean, yeah, well, that's at the what beginning I just said. during our war. Yeah, yes, yeah. So, okay, uh, you said that uh, you saw the very, the very best of humanity and the worst things, I mean, here, here in Bosnia. Uh, what was the best and was, what was the worst that you witnessed here? Well, I think the best was ordinary people and how they kept their dignity and their humanity. It is really hard to imagine how you can be, you know, treated like, like people of the cave era, you know, and, and, still, and still have your humanity. And, you know, we read stories of World War II and World War I and all the, you know, thousands of years of history. And when you see it yourself, it's dramatic and it's formative and it's humbling and it's really vital to know that human beings still can summon that kind of humanity, it's the only word to call it really, under the worst, worst of situations as everybody is trying to, 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 to turn them into animals, they still are human beings. And that's a, a lesson that I will never forget, and it's the lesson that Bosnia taught me. So what's the worst? The worst is opposite. The worst is those people who sat in the hills and didn't care that they were taking people's lives and, 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 and based on a lie, based on a political lie, based on a, you know, a false political objective, you know, they were killing men, women, and children for no good reason. There's never any good reason to kill men and women and children. But in this case, there really was no reason. And they were tearing apart the fabric of a society who had, by and large, lived okay together. Of course, history had many ups and downs, but by and large, it was a unique place, this place, Bosnia. And it was a gift, really. Uh, look, the Haggadah is still in this city. Mm -hmm. This is the city that was a refuge for the Jews after the Inquisition. and. It's very rare to have that kind of, of, of example to the world, and they were trying to destroy it. Yeah. 
So Christian, you became an honorary citizen of Sarajevo in 2000. Uh, but what I've heard that you, that you realized that, I mean, years later. Why? Well, I think it was Zoran <laughs> who told me uh, that I was an honorary citizen of Sarajevo. Um, yeah, the message didn't get to me, but you know what? I don't mind. I love it. It's great. It's a great honor. And it means a huge amount to me. It really does, particularly the citation. It's basically about telling the truth during the war. And look, as I say, I was a young journalist. I had to learn how to tell the truth. And not only that, I don't mean learn how to tell the truth because I was brought up to tell the truth, but learn how to continue telling the truth when everybody wanted me to say something that fitted their narrative. In other words, all sides are equally guilty. And this is, you know, centuries of ethnic hatred and it's a terrible civil war. That's what much older and wiser people than me were saying and much more powerful people than, than me obviously were saying. And I quickly realized that it wasn't the truth and that I had to tell the truth. And so some people tried to tell me that or try to say, oh, Christian, she's lost her objectivity, mm -hmm. she's siding with the people, she's pro-Muslim, she's this. And it was like, excuse me, why don't you just come and visit for a second, you know? And, but it was, it was difficult because again, you know, when you have people say that about you in public and you think, well, you know, am I doing something wrong here? But I learned here not to give in to group think, not to give in to the herd mentality, and to know what I was seeing and to stick by my guns in terms of telling the truth. And I did it in the second Gulf War too. I refused to go along with what all the US media was basically allowing President Bush a free pass to, to, to conduct the war in Iraq. And many times I told stories that were different to the official narrative and it was very unpopular. You are so popular in this country, especially in Sarajevo. There is fun use of your name. And uh, when someone wants to say that uh, he or she is a better journalist than someone else, he or she usually says, oh, listen, I'm Christian, I'm poor to you. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> are you aware of it? <laughs> I'm not aware of it, but I'm, I'm very touched by the warm welcome I always get when I come here. And I'm very touched by, you know, I, I run into many Bosnians around the world as well. People who've had to leave, who left during the war, who never came back. And people who are, you know, leaving, you know, sort of now or traveling or whatever. And it's a very personal connection, I think, for me and for them. And um, I'm glad. I think it's nice. Yeah, but we, while we are so popular in Sarajevo, in, in Serbia, in Republika Srpska, uh, politicians and ordinary people say that you were against Serbs during the war, that you advocated military intervention against Serbs in Bosnia, bombing uh, of Serbia during Kosovo war. I mean, what's your, what's your response to these uh, <laughs> accusations, if I may so say so? My response is very simple. It was a media war, right? It was a media war as much as any other war. So when one side is trying to conduct a genocide or an ethnic cleansing or carving out its own little statelet or whatever it might be, you know, it doesn't like it when the narrative is challenged. So of course it's gonna say, well, that person is, you know, against us or, you know, we're the victims and this and that. Um, I spent quite a lot of time on the Bosnian Serb side I did a lot of reporting from the Radovan Karadzic side, a lot of reporting from that side. I feel I covered all sides very, very thoroughly. It was more difficult to cover the other side because we were much more hampered and we were, you know, often not allowed in. But I don't think that I was anti-Serb. I think I was anti what they were doing and I was anti uh, the fact that men, women and children were being slaughtered for no good reason. And I think that I held up a mirror that they didn't like. So yes, I know that they said that about me during the war. And I know they said that I was responsible for military intervention. I don't think that's true. I think that um, we simply told the truth and the story was the story. And we went to the market and we saw the shelling of marketplaces and we went to Srebrenica and we went to Garage Day and we went to all these other places and we lived in Sarajevo and we saw what happened with our own eyes. We also went to Belgrade and it was very different to what was happening here. We went to Pale and it was very different to what was happening here. So we showed, you know, what was going on. I believe that today, you know, Serbia, 
is a much more democratic place, and I have reported on that as well. And today, we sit here on the anniversary of Srebrenica, and Novak Djokovic is, you know, going to be playing in the final of Wimbledon. And to me, he is the new face of Serbia. And that generation is the new reality of Serbia. Even though, you know, politics aren't perfect and there's still a lot of tension and a lot of political work to be done to make this whole Balkan region yeah, sure. real so Europeans. Very closely follow the developments in, in this region in Bosnia and other countries. Uh, is this region uh, headed toward uh, lasting peace or new conflicts? The peace, the peace process is stop the war, and that's good. But it doesn't mean to say the political conflict is over. And I still think that there's so much more political work to be done here to make Bosnia take its rightful place in the community of European nations. And we need to fast track that. I strongly believe that. This place paid too heavy a price yeah, sure. for vested interests to still be dominant. And it's going to take a huge amount of political work. But I think that the whole Dayton process needs to be revisited. And I think they still need a lot of help on that politically from the international community. But that's what I think this place yeah, deserves. Let me, let me ask this question in another way. Uh, what you left after all? Uh, are the organizers and perpetrators of crimes punished enough? Whether the whole project of, kill, of killing punished enough to hang anyone here to start a new war, to prevent a new war? Well, look, most of the ringleaders were indicted and they've been on trial. Now, these trials have gone on for years and years. Some say they're a masquerade, some say they're a charade, but there've been a lot of convictions. Um, there's been, you know, the enshrinement in international law, the crimes that were committed here, including the crimes against women. Rape as a weapon of war is a war crime, thanks to cases that were prosecuted from what happened here in Bosnia. Uh, Karadic and Mladic are still in The Hague, still on trial, and I hope their trials are concluded swiftly, and I hope justice is, is, made to, is, is brought to bear there. Milosevic died before his case was uh, completed, but everybody knows what Milosevic did. And the people of Serbia, after what Milosevic did in, in Kosovo, rose up against him. They didn't want any more of that. Mm -hmm. They didn't want any more of that. And they're the ones who, who toppled Milosevic. And that's really important to remember. Uh, the crimes, they're still being punished. Some would say, wish, we'd, wish it had taken you know, less time. I think, I think the International Criminal Tribunal was a very, very important thing and still is very important. And I, I don't think the fact that that hasn't finished is the, what's going to cause any new conflict. I think the political tension and the unresolved, you know, tension between mm -hmm. the three entities here in Bosnia is what's the problem. Can we have a reconciliation and lasting peace without the truth of what, 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 what had happened here in this region? Look, Many countries did it a different way. Look at the way Rwanda emerged from a massive genocide where a million people were killed. A million people were killed in three months. And yet, look how they've emerged now. Some people have complaints about the political system there, but they've emerged as one of the strongest countries in that Great Lakes region of Africa. It's, it's really incredible what they have done in 20 years. Uh, look at what happened in South Africa after decades of, of apartheid. They had a truth and reconciliation process, which was not about vengeance. It was not about you know, execution and punishment and jail. It was about truth and reconciliation. And for a while, that seemed to do and serve a political and a national reconciliation process. They have problems now, it's true. A lot of economic problems, a lot of racial tension still, you know, the, 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 the the, the, it's not over yet, and they still have a lot of work to do. And the same with this country. The same with this country. There's a lot of political work to be done. And I talk to a lot of people who wish that they could go back to what it was before the war. Maybe they can never go back. Maybe it'll take still longer. But because of the suffering, because of the price that Bosnia paid, we now need, on this 20th anniversary of Srebrenica, mm -hmm to reopen the political project, I think, and figure out a way that this can be 
a much more unified entity and that it's not still divided and it's not still um, you know, at a standstill and that there's some economic hope and young people don't have to leave and there doesn't have to be a brain drain and you know, we could go forward. Yeah, so you have interviewed so many uh, top politicians throughout the world and uh, covered, I mean, uh, uh, the most dangerous places in the world. So uh, what else, I mean, what else to do, I mean, in, in, in your career? Lots, there's still lots to do. I, you sort of do it in different ways. I mean, you know, 20 years ago, I was a, you know, a hard-hitting foreign correspondent. That lasted a long time, and now I'm a, try to do the same, but in, you know, in a studio, try to be a hard-hitting interviewer of all these world leaders, and, you know, try to figure out and hold them accountable, and, you know, really ask them the questions that people want mm -hmm. to know and want answers to. Um, I love doing documentaries. Uh, uh, there, you know, there's still people on my wish list to interview the Pope, Do you, do the you Queen, still believe that, uh, that media, the television can make uh, a our world a better, better place? <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. I'm not a cynic. I'm about two or three times your age and I'm less cynical than you are. <laughs> I'm not a cynic. I'm because talking from, a, from our pers perspective. Yeah, from no, Boston no. From, from, you know, I, I do believe it. It depends on who's doing the television. You know, television is, is just television. It's who's doing it, who's the reporter, who's the producer, who's the camera people, who are the people who are involved in telling these stories. Because in the end, it's just telling stories. And that's the agenda. The agenda is to tell stories, not to be a political influence. It's just to tell the stories, and then people can figure out what's going on. I, do I think, you know, TV news has become too much about entertainment and stunts and me, me, me? Yeah, I do. Yeah. But there's still a lot of really good journalism out there, and I think that um, they still have a very positive impact on the world. Okay, great. So, at the end, for the end of this interview, I mean, what's your advice to the young uh, journalistic generations? I mean, uh, at the time when many journalists are actually frustrated by the fact that people like to watch, I mean, uh, cheap entertainment, uh, reality shows, and, uh, and other stuff. I mean, uh, instead of uh, investigative journalism, serious news, etc. I would say to a young journalist that despite the way the whole business has morphed, despite the fact that entertainment has entered, you know, what should be information and fact-based news, to stick to the facts, to figure out ways to tell stories that are accurate and truthful and hard-hitting, but also accessible, to, to, to develop, you know, really impactful ways of telling stories, which doesn't mean to throw journalistic principles out of the window. Keep the journalistic principles, and what are the principles? The principles is to tell the truth, and to find the stories, and to keep shining those lights in dark corners, and to realize that you are the eyes and ears of people who are sitting at home, reading, watching, going online, whatever, whichever way they get their information or news. It doesn't matter whichever way they get it, it's about what they get, it's about content. And so we are still the content gatherers and providers and the storytellers. And I think our value added now is to be uh, the trusted, credible uh, purveyor of information. People with all this amount of news and information that's available at any given time or place, they need, I think, I need somebody trusted, some institution that's trusted that I can get my information from. So that's what they should aim to do. Great. Thank you, Christian. You're it's, welcome. It's been my, my real pleasure having you here. And say hello to our colleagues uh, at CNN and we as N1ers here in Bosnia and other countries in the region. We are proud of being uh, your partners. Thank you. And we're proud too. And many of you have been with us for many, many years in one way or another. And our success, especially when we come to your country, depends on people like yourself and local journalists who help us. We couldn't do it on our own, and that's another real strength of, of partnership. And um, so we say thank you as well. Cijenjeni gledatelji bi ovo N1 na 1, naša gošća, Kristijana Amampur, jedna od najvećih novinarki svih vremena. Doviđenja. Doviđenja i hvala lijepo.